with demand expected to come back. But the question remains, does this mean the economy is back on track? Companies now, after experimenting with offshore in places like India, Philippines, and Poland, want to bring those jobs back. We invest in the U.S. We're the biggest exporter in the country. In the cycle and right now, we're creating jobs. From Radio America, it's Neil Asbury's Made in America, the show that explores American industry, large and small, and promotes American-made products everywhere. Put Neil Asbury's Made in America to work for you. Welcome to Made in America. I'm your host, Neil Asbury, together with co-host Dr. Rich Ruffman. Hey, Rich, you know, it's uh, going to be a really fascinating show today. we got Steve Mosher coming on today, who's a China expert, author, and he's just published a book, The Bully of Asia, Why China's Dream is the New Threat to the World Order. And uh, I, I think it's, it's, it's quite appropriate, you know, with what's about to unfold here. I, I think it's 100% correct. And what's going to, you know, no what's going to occur? And it's really fascinating when, uh, when China, you know, when China, when China is the one out there saying we're the free traders and we believe in an open oh, and sure. free economy. Oh, sure. right. It is the United yeah. States yeah. that's the one messing it all up. But, you know, it, it's because the United States is taking action because you've just been totally deaf for how long it's been, you know, after successive administrations of just of just stonewalling into where now you've got a president who's just not going to go along with that any longer. Well, they didn't have to relate to that. See, this is the whole thing that's been bothering me. For years, we don't enforce, we don't go after, we don't do. So the non-norm becomes the norm. Now that we're trying to actually have the norm, which belongs in a sense of legality and what's fair and understandable but more legal, people are freaking out because they can't handle the legality of what we really should be doing. Like protecting our intellectual property. Yeah, the, the, the interpretation. Which I am an owner of a lot and which I'm getting ripped off every day. And, and that's a big deal right now. It's right? a very big deal yeah. because it's our entrepreneurs who can't defend themselves. You know, how can an entrepreneur, you know, somewhere out there in America go up against communist China? How, how can they do that? You know, they can't, you know, and, it, and it's just gone on and on and on and on and on. We've gotten ripped off over and over again. And it's, it's not right. It's just not right. Something has to change. That's exactly right. And when, when the government's business philosophy is to rip you off to actually take from you, steal from you, and they codify that in their laws and rules and their social mores and business mores, you've got a problem. So, yeah, yeah, bad guys. you got a problem, bad and, and it, something has to be done with it. I'm looking forward to this conversation. Oh, we had the conversation. Hey, I mean, isn't yeah, the American right. way you got to look after the underdogs? Isn't the underdogs of the world the American entrepreneur? And right now, you know, someone is out there trying to fight on our behalf. At least, at least we have a chance. There's a glimmer of hope that someday, someday, all of that intellectual property that we've invested so much, including hiring people and all the different sorts of things you have to do to register your intellectual property, now we might actually be able to protect it and create more great jobs in this country. Hey, but look, you know, you know, the, the jobs numbers, what's going on with the jobs numbers? You know, this is really incredible in, in the jobs market. And we're going to actually have a couple of segments on this today. We have uh, Trisha, uh, Trisha Rudnauer from the Employers Association going to be on here recently. going to talk about millennials and how they're going about looking for jobs. And are they staying and even giving their notices anymore before they go on to another job? You know, this is fascinating. The job market is so hot. So what is going on with the June jobs numbers? And uh, we're very pleased to have on with us right now. Mark Hamrick, who's a senior economic analyst at Bankrate.com. He's got a lot of thoughts about about the job market and specifically the June job numbers. Mark, welcome to Made in America. Good to be with you, Neil. Thanks for having me. So what should we expect here in June? I mean, is this is this rosier getting rosier? Uh, well, I, I don't know uh, that uh, we should look for anything that is uh, remarkably strong. Uh, let's take a look back, first of all, over the course of the past year. We've averaged close to 200,000 jobs added a month. It just so happens that that it works out to be close to the expectation for the numbers that we're going to get. Uh, mind you, uh, you know we're in the ninth year now of the economic expansion, quite mature as expansions go, uh, meaning that none last forever. But right now we see no sign that is going to end anytime soon. 
So uh, we see a number of signs uh, that this uh, final month of the second quarter, which probably uh, may be the strongest quarter of the year with GDP topping 3 percent, that it should fall in line with uh, the recent trend. So uh, I personally look for something that is not quite touching that 200,000 number and the number of jobs added. The expectation is, and mind you, it's a very difficult number to predict that the unemployment rate will probably stay right around 3.8 percent. Let's also remember that uh, the current level the unemployment rate is the lowest since early 2000. If we get one-tenth percent lower, meaning 3.7 or below, then we start getting down to an unemployment rate that would be the lowest since 1969. So we go in a musical sense from uh, sort of the uh, new wave and uh, punk rock era to the the era of the Beatles and the British invasion with one uh, single uh, one-tenth of percentage point move lower when we get there. And I do think we'll continue to make improvement with the unemployment rate, barring the tremendously unforeseen uh, negative event. So, Rich, I mean, can you imagine the summer of the summer of love, 1969, <laughs> you know, the, the, the summer of love. I mean, the Vietnam War was at its height. I mean, it was an amazing time. You know, uh, yeah, it's an amazing me. time. Yeah. And we could actually see unemployment, you know, at the rate of 3.5 percent, which has not been there since the summer of love. Well, what I find astounding is that, you know, the, we haven't heard this. And along since we've been doing shows practically, Neil, and it's many years now that there were more jobs and there were people looking for jobs. And, and the unintended consequence of that is that people are just disappearing from a job and cutting out and go to another job. And I just find that to be astounding from where we just were recently. So, Mark, I mean, is, is you know, you, you, you talk about the job market here and. You know, you also talk about in your report about tariffs and and about, you know, specifically you mentioned about Canadian lumber and how the tariffs would would potentially, you know, if they stand and right now they stand at about nine thousand dollars to the cost of a new home, a quarter of a million dollar home. I believe it was. I mean, is this is uh, is the threat of tariffs on the horizon? Is that is that going to be, uh, you know, putting putting water on this uh, huge expansion that we're looking at right now? Well, it's already here, and we can look, for example, at the minutes from the most recent Federal Reserve meeting where uh, not only you have staff but all the members of the Federal Open Market Committee discussing uh, both data and sort of projections about where they think the economy is going. Uh, Part of their information is based on surveys of business contacts all across the country, and those contacts uh, reported that uh, they're absolutely either delaying or cutting back uh, capital investment. And so what's an extension of capital investment? Hiring. So uh, this is being seen across the country. Uh, And for example, when you see things like a significant diminution or decline in things like soybean exports, uh, the same with aluminum, uh, those are not uh, things that have uh, zero impact on hiring uh, trends. And so I guess the question is, you know, how does this end? And, and, and like a movie that we don't know what the script uh, contains, we don't know how it ends. But we know right now that the measure of business uncertainty that's out there is absolutely having an impact. And, and as, as we know, business uncertainty generally is, is not a positive. I want to ask you a question about the feds because you brought it up and it intrigues me right now, uh, particularly with the, their commentary this week. Um, you know, Larry Kudlow kind of broke with uh, a procedural and protocol and was actually asking the feds to slow down the raising of the rates. And they anticipate two more, according to the Fed notes, they anticipate two more before year's end. And, and there are a number of economists out there that feel that slowing down the economy right now may not be the greatest thing to do, not the best thing to do. And even think it may be the political thing to do as opposed to the correct thing to do. I'd just like to get your thoughts on that. Sure. Well, uh, you're right that, that it did seem to be uh, sort of a, a, a move outside the norm when uh, the president's economic advisor, uh, in a sense, seemed to implore the Fed uh, to make uh, a certain kind of um, decision. But the reality is that essentially the members of the Federal Open Market Committee go into the boardroom uh, each and every meeting, which occur um, essentially every six weeks, and and take a look at the data in real time and, and make their decisions there. Yes, they do issue projections about what they expect to do at every other meeting, but those, as we've seen in the past, are not locked in stone. So uh, the reality is, is that I don't think 
Ludlow's remarks have virtually any impact on those individuals because they are politically independent. It's not that they are tone deaf to the concern that he's expressing. Uh, as one who's attended almost every Federal Reserve news conference since they began in 2012, um, I think that every chair of the Federal Reserve, going back to Bernanke in recent history, to Yellen and now um, Jerome Powell, uh, understands that monetary policy is um, a, a, a tool which is wielded uh, with a great deal of impact, and to make a mistake uh, has tremendous impact, and that's the last thing that they, you know, quote unquote, want to do. Uh, you know, the Fed is trying to re- sort of take away the jet fuel which was poured on the economy to try to reignite something, and uh, even as we speak, interest rates are abnormally low, um, and uh, it's trying to sort of wean the economy off of that, and it's, and it's not an easy thing to do. Mark, very, very insightful. I mean, we could have uh, went on. We've we got to get you back because I want to talk about wage growth, uh, which is stagnating. But we're going to have to do that at another time. Hey, we really appreciate you coming on the show. Uh, it's my great pleasure. Thanks for having me. Look forward to having uh, another conversation with you down the line. Folks, that was Mark Hamrick, a senior economic analyst from Bankrate.com. Coming up Dr. Rothman and I are going to have a discussion about a number of issues impacting your jobs. You don't want to miss this. Made in America. Welcome to Made in America. I'm your host, Neil Asbury, together with co-host, Dr. Rich Rothman. Hey, Rich, very, very insightful discussion with Mark Hamrick uh, from Mm Bankrate.com. And one of the things I wanted to get to, uh, unfortunately, we didn't have time to, is is wage growth. You know, despite this economic growth that we've been having, you're not seeing it necessarily, not necessarily in wage growth. What do you think about that? Well, I, 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 I'm an- anxious to see the second half of this year and how the numbers come out. I mean, numbers that we did see this year look like a 2.7% increase in wages um, overall. Which seems to me pretty good. Well, I thought, I thought people were excited by that. But now I'm depressed because I'm reading all the stuff out there where they're saying, well, it's not growing fast enough. And maybe it isn't, Neil. Maybe it's disproportionate. You know, maybe this is an opportunity that the employers need to, you know, um, uh, you know, get serious and, and help people who need to grow their wages. Look, the middle class hasn't had serious great uh, wage growth in quite a while. It, it's been decades since they've actually made some progress with it. So you would think if we're going to have such a strong, heated economy, you see, this is what concerns me. If we're having such a strong, heated economy that uh, the Feds want to tamper down the potential of for inflation or an overheated economy. Yet if that's happening, what's happening with the wage growth? If you slow down the economy, are you going to then eliminate the opportunity to have further wage growth? So 2.7 can't go to 5.6 or 4.2 or 3.8 percent. You just you don't get the opportunity because the market's not there anymore. That, it, it's a very fine then, line. Then, then once you have that, then you're going to have inflation. But it's it's really what kind of jobs are being created and and where is that wage growth? And we're going to be talking about that here in a second about about uh, uh, how hard it is to recruit people. And, you know, as an employer myself, i got to tell you, it's hard to get good talent. I mean, and that's all over the country. I have facilities all over the country, and it's hard to get good people anywhere in the country. Now, you have a lot of people are still unemployed, and you have, you know, wages that are not yet growing at the, at the rate that the economy is growing. It's because, you know, we have a lot of skills in this country that's not meant for the sort of new world order. And in and, and one of the headlines that came out this week was landlords are practically giving malls away. Yeah, isn't and that amazing? That. So all of those retail jobs, you know, I don't think that their wages are growing. I mean, it's it's like, you know, malls themselves are shrinking. Well, exactly. The retail jobs aren't retail jobs anymore. Right. That's a problem. So if that was your skill set, you know. You're in those, trouble. And, and those, yeah, so all, yeah. Of that, all of that stuff yeah. is kind of being factored into these numbers is that there are people in this economy that's getting displaced. So what do we do about those folks, Rich? Well, what it comes down to also, something that we've been talking about, you're going to retrain, you're going to learn. Look at market trends. Look at industry trends. Look at product trends. Where is that going over the next five years, ten years, eight years? But who's responsible for that? I mean, it kind of sounds like Hillary Clinton going to Appalachia and saying, hey, we're going to kill all your jobs, no, I think, and no, we're I, going to retrain you. No, that's, that's different. That's when the government 
is playing the game and that government's making the decisions. If she became the president, she made it very, very clear. Her policies will put you out of work, period. That's one of the reasons she didn't win. She was bragging about it. Oh, she thought that was cats. That was great. Why, you know, how do you go to West Virginia or Kentucky and tell these poor people who are working so hard over their lives, you're not going to have it. Vote for me because you need to because it's my turn. Vote for me. And, of course, well, you'll be out of a job. But we have a lot of welfare for you. No, I think it's different when someone makes a unilateral decision and says, look, I need to know where the market's going to be in three years, five years, four years, even 24 months. And they make that decision to do something for themselves, which may include, include you know, re-educating oneself. May also be improved apprenticeship programs may have to come into play. But then where does this stuff uh, come in? And I know that robots, you and our good friend Dave Brim up in Chicago, I mean, it's all about robots. We used to have a robot report here, artificial intelligence. And get this headline, Kroger to bring driverless cars to grocery delivery. I mean, It's all changing. That, imagine that a car it's, pulls up, there's no one in it. But your but your bread and milk are there. I mean, it's it, that's kind of bizarre, but that's the kind of world that we're going to be living in. And what happens with those jobs and those people? Well, they're gone. It, it's it, you know, City Citibank this week said you know very easily, it, very very soon, ten thousand jobs will disappear due to artificial and intelli- intelligence ro- robots. And now they're finding out that they now have created software that once a robot sees you doing your job. They imprint that into their brains, and they can then replicate you by seeing you just once, Neil, just once on the job training for somebody that says Samsung across their forehead. That's a big difference. And, and, and yes, I think it's going to accelerate on the AI side faster than you and I ever anticipated and anybody else anticipated. It's coming. But yet there's more and more people who are part of our, uh, are part of our economy. That's part of the workforce. A food stamp enrollment dips to lowest level in eight years. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that's the, a good. Eat. You know, I mean, under uh, Barack Obama, I mean, the the food stamps and and, and welfare just <laughs> exploded. It just, it just exploded. Yeah, it right. Was bad. Because it was because bad. there were no jobs. Yeah. So now there are jobs. So d- despite you know all of these things, uh, the tectonic shifts within our economy, malls being empty, they can't give them away. Robots, artificial intelligence, driverless cars, and all of this stuff going on. Wages are not growing as fast as a lot of people would like, but yet food stamp enrollment dips to its lowest level in the uh, uh, last eight years. There are a lot of conflicting sort of data coming out into the market. Well, you know, let's let's look at the, the bigger picture as well. Let's pull back for a second. You know, five years ago, you and I were discussing how people were working not just one job, but two jobs and maybe three jobs, because each one of those jobs by itself was not providing enough to support your family. So you had multiple jobs. Now... You don't hear about that as much as you did five years ago, six years ago. Hey, we're trying to continue this discussion. And, and folks, you don't want to miss this. Uh, coming up is Trisha Ragnauer. She's with the Employers Association. We're going to talk about uh, how people are looking for jobs these days. And because there are so many, are they even giving notices anymore? I mean, what's going on with that? You don't want to miss this. Made in America. higher at the open stocks continued to perform well over the course of the day tuesday and i think that bodes well here over the next couple years for having bigger demands coming to this country now more of neil asbury's made in america welcome to made in america i'm your host neil asbury together with co-host dr rich ruff and we've got a really passionate fired up show here this week lots of great great topics and right now we're going to talk about what's the job market looking like and and how are jobs being transitioned. And I got to tell you, as an employer, you know it's hard to find talent, Rich. I mean, if if you got a pulse rate in this country, you got a job, and and it's not just in one part of the country; it's all over the country. But you know, it's a time honored thing that you know. And and I love people, you know, increasing their careers and moving on and doing better for themselves. Hey, look, and if I can't provide the opportunity and someone else can. God bless them. You know, they were here. It was great. You know, hopefully as an employer, I helped out along the way. They'll look back fondly about working for the company and used us as a way to improve their lives and their families' opportunities. Totally get that. But, you know, how about the courtesy of giving a notice, right? 
because a lot of people are doing things. It's not like we an entrepreneurial company doesn't have people standing around just doing nothing. And, you know, we got we don't have two people doing one job. So if someone leaves, you know, you'll like a little bit of time. And typically, you know, two weeks, three weeks, depending how senior the position is, four weeks. But, you know, should they just not show up? We got right now joining us. Trisha Ragnauer, who's from the Employers Association, and she's going to fill us in on this. Trisha, welcome to Made in America. Thank you. So in the piece that uh, you've just been recently quoted in, uh, you brought up this concept of ghosting. You know, ghosting. I mean, there's all kinds of new concepts and ideas coming out in the, in the world, and, you know, it, it's amazing. But ghosting, you know, I, I haven't heard that before. What is ghosting? Um, the term is really to identify that phenomena where somebody just stops responding, whether it's a phone call, an email, whatever that might be, you stop hearing from them. And how does that apply to, to, our, to our job market today and people who are out there working and maybe trying to find a better opportunity for themselves? Absolutely. So we have so many jobs that are available right now, and we have people who, from the beginning, in the interview process, maybe not show up for the interview, uh, not show up after accepting a job, never call, never email, and then, of course, as you've been mentioning, maybe come to work for a little while, maybe they find something new and stop showing up at that job without making that phone call to let their employer know what's going on. You know, I, I, it, it's an amazing statement to me because I can't imagine, I'm a different generation, but I just can't imagine that if you don't want to be in that job, you're not going to stay where you are, that you just don't take the high road. and Because and, uh, and, it, it is your reputation. I mean, it's always been the one thing you take with you is your reputation. So you want to do the right thing. At least that's the way I've always led my life. And how could someone not so tr- tr- give tr- notice? Is- is this a generational thing? Yeah, is this I mean, a trend that we're seeing here? Is this is it is it the millennials? Is it is it the old farts like Rich? I mean, <laughs> I mean who is it? Who's doing this ghost thing out there? I, I think that m- many employees are doing that. I think that the term is definitely tied to a younger generation, and actually probably started in those romantic relationships, and you stop calling the person after a date or, or something of that nature. And then, honestly, employers over the years when there were uh, so many workers and not enough jobs where maybe we're only getting back to those candidates that we were interested in moving forward with and not always given that courtesy to respond back and say we've decided on somebody else. So now we've kind of got the tables turned a little bit. Maybe it's inexperience. Maybe it's the conflict or not really wanting to have that confrontation. But, yeah, sometimes we've got people that are just not calling and they're not letting the employer know. And as you mentioned, yeah, it, it, it is a common courtesy to, to do that. Yeah, you would think. It sounds like, Neil, that people need, you know, this sounds like ghost adventures on, you know, the travel channel <laughs> with Zach. I think we need the ghostbusters you know, you, around here. You we need, need no, you need a ghost. spirit advisor. So you can you can get somebody into the, you know, the area where they were working and see if you can make contact with them and find out where their spirit went. <laughs> I mean, this is just like unbelievable. So so what do empl- employers do? What, what what's your advice? Yeah, what's, what's your, your advice? advice on this? Where what, do you go with this? What do we do as an employer here to try to keep our people happy? I mean, what do we do? So honestly, many employers are beginning to, I think, realize that they want to stay in communication and definitely continue to follow up with candidates all the way through the process instead of, hey, we'll see you in a month on your first day, for example, maybe contacting them periodically during that transition time to ensure that everything is going well. Some employers are also kind of keeping several people maybe on the hook and moving them through with the idea that if somebody else doesn't show up or doesn't come to the interview, then we have some other candidates. So we never really stop recruiting if this is a crucial role and making sure that we're always going to have somebody in kind of the, the background ready to come in. Yeah, well, that's that's always been my philosophy. I've had eight different companies, and, and the philosophy is that you always keep recruiting. You always, always interview. Always yeah. have a list of people that you know of or are interested in, in, in fulfilling jobs that you may or may not have you know, at your company at the time being. But at least you have a, a database of people who are interested. But I do find it. I mean, don't people care anymore that you, 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 have, a, you have references? You know, you yeah. have, you have a, a litany of things that you've done. You have to explain what your successes are and why someone should hire you. 
it just seems like when someone, if you interview for another job before you quit this next, the other job you had, that they say, well, you know, what are you doing now? And, and what do you, do you not tell them? Yeah, and don't you? And, that and, seems so weird. And Trisha, wouldn't it be like, I mean, if someone leaves a job and was ghosting and they and they just kind of leave, I mean, don't you need references? I mean, where, so in, as, as an employer, I mean, where are references in all of this? You would think that people would want to build their resume with good references. Absolutely, absolutely. And unfortunately, it does come back on some of these people who have left organizations or who didn't show up. They try to apply later, maybe back to that same job or in the reference situation, go to another job and the company is contacted and says, yeah, they just stopped showing up. And those things have had that negative impact. I think that's probably where that inexperience and not realizing that companies are going to call one another. And I think that um, that's definitely important, and companies need to keep those lists of people that stop showing up and check the references for the people that they're considering hiring so that they know what they're getting. Hey, Trisha, it's been wonderful talking to you. We've been talking to Trisha Ragnauer from the Employers Association and about the ghosting. Rich, I mean, that's that's great. I learned something today. You know Trisha, what I learned? You know what I learned, Neil? We, you we learn? haven't had that spirit here since 1969. Oh, no. I had to say it. Hotel I California. It. Hotel California. Oh, my Just goodness. Saying. Sorry. Well, <laughs> what do I say to that, Tricia? <laughs> Thanks for coming on the show. No problem. Thank you. Coming up, we got Steve Mosher, who's a China expert and author, going to talk about his new book, The Bully of Asia, Why China's Dream is the New Threat to World Order. Wow, Rich. This, this is a Tough big stuff. Title. Big stuff. You don't want to miss it. Made in America. Welcome to Made in America. I'm your host, Neil Asbury, together with co-host, Dr. Rich Rothman. So, Rich, it's time to talk about China. Mm. Time to talk about China. You know, we've covered China a lot lately. And, uh, you know, it's just, it's, it's, but, you know, this thing is going to ratchet up. It's going to ratchet up. And, and on so many different levels, you know, you've got the North Korea situation. You've got the tariffs. You've got the intellectual property side. You have how we are treated as investors uh, in China or how Chinese investors are treated into our country. Is it fair? Is it not fair? You know, who's right? Who's wrong? You got the Spratleys, you know, which is these contested islands in the South China Sea, uh, which, you know, it doesn't get a lot of publicity, but boy, you know, that could become a hot spot very, very quickly. You know, it's there. It's simmering. Let me tell you, it's been simmering for a long time, but, you know, they're, up, they're upping the ante there. And what is about 80% of the world's Shipping passes through, uh, you know, in between South China and the Philippines. And, and in there, you got Vietnam, you got Malaysia, you got Singapore. I mean, it's uh, it's everybody's uh, 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 claiming the Spratleys to be their own. I mean, it's something that uh, we got to keep our eyes on. Not a good thing. The, that Taiwan, the Chinese did that with those islands. That's Bad right. Thing. And then, Bad thing. And then, of course, the Taiwan situation. And, you know, that's still far from being resolved. But to help us understand all of this and to put this into somewhat into a, 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 an intelligent order of things, we have Steve Mosher, who is a China expert. And the recent book he's just published, he's published a lot of books, Bully of Asia, Why China's Dream is the New Threat to World Order, which you can buy at Amazon. You can buy it directly from him and get an autographed copy. He's going to tell you how to do that here just in a moment. Steve, welcome to Made in America. Oh, it's very good to be here. So, you know, I, I just don't know where to start. I, I just don't know where to start. I mean, this this relationship, I mean, it's just absolutely mind boggling. You know, all the different possibilities. Uh, wow. I mean, you've got to be a genius to try to figure this one out. But but give us a little color on on the uh, on the tariffs. I mean, what is the way out of this? I mean, both sides are very hard on this. You know, what's going to what's it going to take for these two to start talking again? Well, let, let, let's understand one thing that the. That the trade war uh, was started by China was started by China 25 years ago, uh, when Deng Xiaoping said after the collapse of the Soviet Union, um, "Hey, America won the first Cold War, but China's going to win the second Cold War uh, with the United States." And they so China basically declared war on us across all domains, not the kinetic, obviously we're not firing bullets at each other, but across all other domains of intellectual property, uh, cyber 
attacks to 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 unreasonable territorial claims to cheating on to the value of currency. I mean, the list of ways that China cheats is almost endless. You can imagine if you can imagine a way to cheat. Uh, China's not only doing it, but it's actually got a government program staffed by government employees with with government funding to do exactly that. I know that uh, Dr. Peter Navarro, my old friend at the White House, like 50 different ways uh, that China cheats in various areas on trade and intellectual property and so forth. And he's not even done. He's only a third of the way through the whole process of uh, evaluating the ways that China cheats. So um, that's that's what we've got here. We, we You know, the problem is if we, if we were dealing with a country that shared our values and institutions, right, uh, we would be able to peacefully work this thing out. China does not share our values and institutions. As everybody knows, it's a one-party dictatorship ruled by a new red emperor, Xi Jinping, who is consciously modeling himself on Chairman Mao Zedong. You know, I went to China in 1979. I was the first American scholar allowed to do research on the ground in China. I was selected by the State Department and the National Security Council. And when I got there, people had big posters in their living room with pictures of Chairman Mao. Now, if you go in Chinese houses, there is a big poster of Xi Jinping, the new red emperor, in the exact same place that the old posters of Mao used to be. We're in the middle of a new cultural revolution in China, a high-tech cultural revolution, uh, and it's a dangerous thing for China and for the world. So, um, Steve, in in the short time we have left, about 45 seconds, uh, you've just recently written on uh, on the North Korea situation and how China may play their hand there. Uh, Give us an update. Well, we've, we've succeeded in, in uh, uh, removing China uh, from, from the table in part, right? China's always been a spoiler uh, in the negotiation with North Korea because they've had North Korea's back. North Korea is their only ally in the world. And now, of course, we've said to China, if you interfere with our efforts to, to deal with North Korea, you're going to suffer on the trade front. We're going to, you're not going to be able to get as good terms from us. So I think for the first time, we put China in a kind of a box and they're cooperating uh, you know, kind of dragging them along unwillingly to cooperate in uh, in, in the North Korean situation. But with the trade war, do they still cooperate? Well, that's that's the thing. They want favorable terms on trade, and so they're willing to help us to some degree on North Korea. But we've caught them cheating on a half dozen occasions, and so we've got to be watching them uh, vigorously. But for the first time, I am confident that, that, that America's best days are ahead of it and not behind it. China has a lot of problems, uh, unemployment, uh, a shrinking labor market, uh, aging population, high national debt. And so America is back. Steve, unfortunately, we're out of time. You've been listening to Steve Mosher, who's the uh, uh, author of his, his newest book, is Bully of Asia, Why China's Dream is the New Threat to World Order. Get it on Amazon. And Steve, where else can you get this book? Well, you can get it from from us at the Population Research Institute, which I direct. Our website is pop.org. That's P-O-P dot O-R-G. And if you get it from us, I can autograph it before it goes out. Hey, Steve. Well, very, very good. Thanks for being on the show. Very fascinating. Thanks for having me. Important topic. Coming up, coming up, Dr. Rothman and I are going to have some final thoughts to the day. Made in America. Welcome to Made in America. I'm your host, Neil Asbury, together with co-host Dr. Rich Ruff. And Rich, I can't believe, I can't believe this is our last segment of the day. But uh, boy, has it flown by. Lots of really, really fascinating topics. It's a fascinating world. It's a fascinating time. But uh, discussion with Steve Mosher about his new book and about China and about how this whole thing has kind of been evolving, you know, for the last 25 years. And, you know, this isn't just something that happened overnight. I mean, this is something that has been set in place for quite a long time. And, uh, you know, I mean, in the beginning, you know, China, it had nothing. I was over there. He talked about being there in 1979. I was there in 1982. It was a very, very different country, um, very, very different country. And, of course, at that time, you have trade relations with a country. And I think America is a very generous country. We want to help. 
China was coming out of these dark ages, literally, the, you know, the, the whole Mao Zedong thing and the Cultural Revolution. I mean, China was in the dark ages. If you want to know how they lived in the dark ages, just go to China back in 1979, 1981, 82. You know, it was a very different place. It, it just it, it, the deep freeze was on. And, you know, China uh, you know, needed help. You know, America is a very generous country. We gave them access to our market and didn't ask anything in return. We helped them build their country and to build it into this powerhouse. But all the time, I mean, they didn't appreciate any of that. That wasn't anything that they really looked at us and say, hey, wow, you know, those guys really helped us out. You know, when it's our turn, let's help them out. No, I mean, they set into motion exactly what Steve was talking about. And now, you know, we've gotten to this point. Do you just keep turning your head, a blind eye, pretending it doesn't exist, putting your head in the sand? Or do you finally have to confront it? You know, this is the dilemma. So many presidents have put their heads in the sand. This president doesn't do that. He's confronting it. And that's why we are where we are today. Well, I, I think, and, and you should probably have a really good insight on this because you lived over in that area for so many years and you dealt so much in, in Asia. But, you know, it is a, an East versus West psychology. I mean, I think you'd have to agree with that. And I think that if we try to interpret uh, the attitudes and the the best practices as coming out of uh, China, Beijing right now, the government, I think you really have to not view it through the spectrum of, of Western understanding. I think you have to really understand the, the culture and understand where they're coming. And, and we look out a few years, they look out a 100 years, they don't care. They're looking at the long-term game. And the long-term game, I would think, is to be the dominant player in the world. Um, perhaps militarily, we're, we seem to be actually we're in a, in, in a weapons war with China. I mean, that, that, that's cooking. That's happening as we talk right now. We're in a technology war. Well, technology is also weapons. So that's a very important link. But we're in an economic war. We're in, in a monetary war. We're in a manufacturing war. And, and uh, I think if we don't understand the psychology of the people that we're dealing with, then we go into discussions, you go into business, you look at your bottom line, and it's influenced by things that you don't quite understand. So I think when we had Steve Mosher, people like Steve on the show, we've had Gordon Chang just a few we weeks before that. Gordon Chang, by the way, is totally in favor of tariffs with China. He absolutely feels that we should have tariffs with China. But right I would, now. but I would just also like to to caution that Gordon Chang is a member of Academia, and he's not the one out there. No, I, I, I agree with things. that. I agree I with mean, that. If you're, if you're a factory and you want to buy, uh, uh, you need products and you need materials and you need components to run that factory and you want to create jobs in this country, you have to have a supply chain. And China is part of that supply chain. We made it part of the supply chain. You just can't say one day, well, now it's not part of the supply chain. You know, this takes time to evolve. But my point, my, my point, I, that's, a, that, that's a, a tangential. The, the, the focus point is what we were discussing with Steve and understand where they're coming from. And, yeah. and that's why I think a book like Steve's, uh, Steve Mosher's book is very important right now. I think America can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with anybody, right? We can. But there's no question we, we can, can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with we anybody. We invented the toe. <laughs> uh, and, the buck, and the buck stops here. We invented that one, too. Yeah. But the fact is, is that, you know, we can go toe-to-toe. -to -toe. We can hold our own. The American entrepreneur, the American manufacturer, the American inventor, the American risk taker, you know, they're no pushovers. They can represent this country and they can do very, very well. They can create jobs. They can do all of that, but they can't do it, as Steve said, competing against the government of China. We have to find a way to get over this bridge to where we can create these skills in America. That's going to be on another show. But, Rich, unfortunately, we're out of time. Very sad. We are just getting going here. I know. This is this is important. I really think that this topic is crucial, and, and I think we need to get more and more experts on the show to uh, present information to our audience. Because this is, if you understand China, then you may understand where we're going to be in the future. But we can't leave it in the hands Not of the right academic. Now. Absolutely. Either. It's got to be a collaborative. Real effort. time. But we're going to be back again next week for another adventure of Made in America, where we never stop fighting for your jobs. 